Uh, morning, all. Welcome to Dean's Hop. Everybody's here early. Oh, great. Our area director finally got out of the chair. So um, glad you all are here. Um, hey, it's early in the morning in Montreal. So um, you know me. I'm Tim. That's Suzanne. And Benno, stand up. Our, our new chair. Take a little bow. There's Benno. Uh, yay. So, we, got, we have lots of work for him to do. So um, yeah, you know that. Um, Dan, Dan York's doing JavaScript. Paul and Benno are doing minutes. Um, and I think they're going to be in the Etherpad if you want to actually make your own comments as well. You all have seen the note well plenty of times. This seems to be the new updated text. So take a read. You know, you're on point, basically. So there's blue sheets passing around. I know this slide hasn't seen them, but we'll make sure you guys get those. But please, yep, get those filled in. We got the smaller room and the quick people got the bigger room. I was kind of annoyed by that. They're just, where are they? They're just transport people, right? Um, so today on our agenda, we got some document updates. We got some current working group business and previously discussed stuff. The new working group stuff will probably end up getting, is going to be in tomorrow's one hour session. Um, but since our last meeting, we have Benno. He's our new chair. And please be nicer to him. Um, and other news, we have some DS alumni in the news. You know this guy, you know, now president of ISOC. I don't, I don't, I don't think he's here. So, so El Presidente, but yeah, we, you know, we're very proud of him. So, we hope you are too. So, also DNSSD is looking for a new chair to work with David Nazi. Um, it's a nice, quiet working group. doesn't get, Doesn't get out a lot on the weekends and stuff like that. But it, if you're interested, Terry Manderson, who I think I saw show up, there, he's in the back. Um, he's a good person to chat with about that. I'm going to help David on Thursday, but that's just like a, just filling in for the Tim that's not there. But um, anyway, if you're interested, um, Terry's a great AD. It's a very low working group. They got some stuff going on. So, you know, please give a thought. Also, the DMARC work working group guys, um, which I follow for some work stuff, they've got two drafts that are in working group last call. And mostly they were looking at the art protocol one. There's some DNS stuff they wanted us to sort of look at, and I just wanted to call it to people's attentions. I know there's some folks in here, like Mr. Levine and myself and a few others who um, pay close attention to that working group, but if you're interested and you want to make sure there's people are doing the right thing DNS-wise, just take a look. It, it seems mostly pretty straightforward, but yeah, John, John waves his hand. It's, it, you know, it's all news. So, um, we'll give you some quick document updates. Ooh. That's a pretty good one. There you go. So that's excellent. That's excellent. So, so that's our document update. It's all in one place. Um, I know what that is. That is refuse any. Yep. This is the quick, this is the quick HTTP2 version. Everything's on top of each other. So <laughs> but since I wrote it, I know what it is. I know we have refuse any in the ISG queue. And also um, session signaling. And what I was saying in that one is um, there were some discussions that were brought up during the, the IHG reviews, and Stuart and Ted have been working through basically addressing all of those. And they seem to be pretty much documentation, you know, editorial type stuff. And, and things all look good. But if anybody has discussions on that, please do so. Gosh, I hope the next one's better. Wow, this one's good. So we have five working group last call documents finished. KSK will turn on GPS, which just finished the two out of leaf documents. And the, so my promise to you guys, and I've told the other chairs is, is by this Friday, we will have all the shipper write-ups done. If I have to stay here Friday night and do them all, that's just the way it's going to be. Because my my new policy is I'm going to bury Warren and work. So that's, 
Did you was paying attention? No, he's not, so it's good. So, but it's time to move a lot of those over, and we've just, and we're, um, we're going to work with Benno on getting some of these out as well. So, oh, this one's good. Um, here's one. In working with the last call, finishes this week, capture format. Um, we've had no discussion about this, no pro, no con, nothing in the, in the, in the mailing list. And silence is any equal consent in this matter. So we do need folks to basically say, yes, this should progress. No, this should not. You know, what's going on here? So please, this week, just send an email either way to the working group and tell us what's happening there because we do want to. We think this is a good document and we do want to move it forward. But the big one, which is more going to be more entertaining, is 5011 security considerations. This is going back into working group last call. The document is not informational. It updates the key timing draft in a couple places. But there are serious, there's some really rough consensus about this. And we got some comments this morning, and I know we have Mr. you know, Mr. St. John, I've I've misread, I thought I represented you correctly, but I did not. So please take the microphone. The problem is that there was work Mike St. John, sorry. There was working group rough consensus. There is no list consensus. So please stop saying there's rough consensus. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, Wes Fredericker, USCA. Sorry. Um, at, at this point, you know, so I, I think everybody is well familiar with the dialogue. <laughs> uh, it was fun. Uh, it's over to a large extent. So the real question is does everybody think that the document should go forward or not. So in, in my opinion, this is this is the cutting straw. And, and what we ought to do is ask everybody on the list, everybody have the right opinion, yes or no, to the list. And and that'll make the determination. It'll die or it'll go forward. And uh, at this point, I think there's probably not much more editing that needs to be done. So really, the, the final call is yay or nay. And uh, so if you were abstaining from joining the conversation before, because there was lots of math and uh, things like that. Um, read it again anyway, and just think of it in terms of is it beneficial to to the RFC series or not. As, it, as the slide says, it's informational. Um, but just a yes or no. Now, there was very little input to the last consensus round. Yeah, I see our AD there, and then I want to oh, comment. Go ahead. So, um, Warren Kamari, just as an author. So yeah, the authors just saw all of those notes on that the name doesn't quite seem to line up. We're more than happy to change the name, just send email saying that. You know, seems like a reasonable point, and that's kind of what working group last calls are for. You know, point out things that that were missed. Yeah, so for, for, for what it's worth, as far as gauging consensus, that's actually the chair's job. That's what y'all pay us the big bucks for, and all that coffee. Um, but Wes is absolutely right that the, what we need is, is additional input pro and con so that we can call consensus and so that um, our area director with his different hat um, actually you know it, as, a, as a process point because Warren is a co-author on this document we have a different area director who, who is well we hand it off if we, if we if we decide to advance it um, but in any case it gets it's it's down to us and you in this room to call consensus on this and move it forward or not thank you is one Final Sorry. point. I mean, I'm, I'm the physical and virtual room, because it is, it's also on the mailing list for a reason. But that's where the that's where a determination of consensus has to come from. I, I'm even, you know, more than willing to state that if there is no, you know, voice for it should go forward, then that's a fail, right? So silence, in my opinion, is actually a fail, yes. and, and that's how it should be. Yeah. So we agree with that. So, Mike, do you agree with that as well? Silence is a fail. Yeah, Mike St. John's again. I agree with the silences fail, but let me put put one more piece here that's going to confuse things slightly. Sorry. I believe a document like this is useful and should go forward. I have a problem with the content of this document that I have expressed and tried to fix for a long period of time. In the current form, I believe this document is more harmful than good. Thanks. And I apologize for misrepresenting you. I thought I tried to capture all your emails in the Shepherd write-up. And so I, I, I seemed like I failed you some, and so I apologize for that. 
I will work on that, you know, so. Okay. Um, up for adoption is a more lighthearted subject. Um, the multi provider DNS sec draft. Um, this call for adoption ends on Friday as well, and it's informational. It describes operational practices. Um, Shuman's going to talk a little bit, and we are an operational group. Um, so it'd be, you know, I know some people said this doesn't really kind of fit, but um, there got, we had some people who were on the list said, yes, it does seem to fit what's going on sort of thing. And, you know, I think people are trying to do this today. So, well, I know we're trying to do this today. So um, that's all I have to say on that. Also, drafts just in. This stuff just sort of came in. Um, Q name biz basically showed up this week, and I'm kind of very happy about this. It's um, it's it's initial. It, we feel the the initial RFC was a big win in the privacy space, um, but you know we all got burned by some operational issues. Who got burned by that buy nine twelve update? You know, besides you know, you know myself. Um, and it wasn't even me. It was, yeah, I know people hide. <laughs> um, and so. This document will put it on standard track. I, my comment, which I believe the authors know, is um, we do need to flesh out the operational consideration section more, and that's a good thing. But we like this for adoption, and so if there's arguments about that, you'll probably see this coming up for adoption in the next couple of weeks, basically. So, also, oh, this is just the link to the GitHub that we're working on with our document status. Ray's already pointed out something that I dropped. So I'm going to go update that. I apologize for that. Um, and in the slides, it actually looks better than what we got going on now. So um, our agenda, Andre's going to talk about algorithm update. Um, Willem and Andre are going to talk about cookies, operational impacts of cookies. Um, we're going to have a fun discussion about something at the Apex. We had a discussion about SRV and HTTP yesterday. There was a sort of side meeting. There was some interesting back and forth between the two crowds. So. I, I've got a DNS operations view slash user community, and then Andre, he's got some stuff, you know, and he's done some experiments, and Willem's done some stuff from the implementer side. So there's three of us are going to do a quick little round and sort of say feedback. But the, our goal here is, like, I want to find a path forward. You know, everybody does this. You know, we just have to figure out how do we sort of put the user community with the protocol folks together sort of thing, um, that sort of thing. Um, multi provider DNS sec. John's here to do a quick update about bulk RR. Paul's got a, 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 sim, a simpler power bind presentation. I'm just sort of shortened. And Davey's HTTP wire format, um, it's been presented, but it's interesting because we adopted this before Doe, but this is really kind of looking like it's work that maybe is more in Doe, and so we'll discuss that. Um, that sort of, I think, will be the, you know, time of time preventing sort of thing. So let's get started on stuff. Um, it's Mr. Andre with Algorithm Update. So thanks all. Any, any sort of comments on the agenda? Any argument? OK. So we'll just get going. Hi, this is Andre Raisi. Um, this is just an update on like long-standing document on DNS, DNS algorithm update. Um, so uh, basically, hmm, this doesn't feel right. Hold on, they do that. Ah. Yep. So um, because of the document, if you if you haven't, well, who read the document? Well, there's quite a lot of ants. So uh, we want to refresh the list of DNS algorithms, add more as mandatory to implement, or remove the old insecure ones, uh, and do the same for the DS, CDS algorithms. So um, this is just a quick recap what uh, the, the document says. It removes the RSA MD5 DSA algorithms. It this recommends um, so well it like, adds. Um, this is this is for the uh, like signing side. This is for the validation side. So for for signing side, it this recommends the uh, RSA SHA one, uh, but it's still a requirement for validators. Um, uh, 
it removes the ECC ghost because the ECC ghost that we implemented in DNSSEC has been deprecated by the Russian government. There's a new ECC ghost curve, but that hasn't been standardized for, for DNSSEC. So if anybody wants it, the work needs to be done. Um, and uh, it promotes the EC, ECDSA P256 um, to uh, mandatory algorithm recommend, uh, from like the uh, recommended one. And uh, it promotes the ED25519 to, to recommended status with like um, goal to, after the implementation catches on, um, to require uh, the make this uh, like mandatory algorithm to implement in the future. So for the um, CDS algorithms, we did, did, did a similar thing. Again, show one uh, and ghost is is uh, forbidden to be using as a DS. Uh, the validators still must implement the the show one and may uh, do the ghost if, if the implementations want to do that. So um, the, the other change we did, uh, we uh, like changed the algorithm that's mandatory to implement and every implementation should, uh, every implementation must implement it to ECDSAP 256. And um, we think that we address all the comments on the, on, from the working group and the documents ready for a working group last call. So if you have any comments now, we would like to hear them. Have you got any pushback on using the curve algorithms from the vendors? No. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, chair is asking if there was any pushback from the vendors on implementing curve algorithm, and the answer is no. So. Oh, it, 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 well, most of the curves that, uh, well, the ECDSA is, is now well implemented in all crypto libraries. Uh, the ED, DSA um, is in the recent open cell in the recent GNU TLS, and I have no idea about uh, uh, what's the other one, the Mozilla uses. Oh, never mind. Yeah, John Levine, I just have a general question, which is, I mean, to what extent are these, is this Mac that's already implemented in the <laughs> DNS servers we are likely to be using? I mean, is this mostly implemented, or is this a, will this require a bunch of changes? No, it, it's as, as far as I'm aware. Uh, at least I have seen London Labs and, and CZNIC has all these implemented. I have no idea about Power DNS, but I would guess that at least ECDSA is there. Uh, and well, I know uh, they were first to implement the EDDSA, in fact. So, okay. so it's everywhere is implemented, like for things we care. I have no idea about the proprietary implementations. With, if there's somebody from from those vendors here, we'd like to hear from them. But uh, I think we, we covered most of our bases. Mark Andrews, I see. We also need to look at this for key and SIG zero. Do the same exercise. Uh, sure. Add another table because it's been a long time since we've done any housekeeping on key. Uh, sure, key sure, sure. Key for SIG zero. Guess. So I suspect the same set of yeah. um, requirements and may, may, must, and things will come out of that. I had a presentation at the ICANN uh, DNS Symposium about, well, like the old stuff in the DNS. And that was one of my points that we should do stuff like deprecate Diffie-Hellman and add uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman to, to Tiki and uh, update the 6.0. Uh, define the transactional security to six zero for the new algorithms, but that's out of the scope of this document. I, I'm I'm happy to like yeah. collaborate on a, on a new one, new document like this, but uh, yeah. let, let's not stall yeah. this any, yeah. any further. I'm, I'm not so this thing has been new. It's it's related whether it's this document or it's something that needs to be done. Another document. And then, yeah. Jeff and then Paul. Jeff Houston, slight normative terminology question. What's the difference between must uppercase and recommended? Um, well, that's in the RFC. The recommended is alias for should. Why don't you just use should? Because it feels like natural language better. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one level down from must. Hmm? What's the difference? So it's must or should now. and it, it, It's a weird table to understand. I, I could change it to, to should, but it's 
because it's an equivalent and it's defined in the RFC, I don't know yeah. the number, that defines the must and shoulds. And the recommended and not recommended is alias for should and should not. And it, it felt to me that because we remove all those pluses minuses, that the recommended feels like you like you you should do that. Like which is we recommend <laughs> which is which is different from recommended. In yeah. I well, I don't care. I don't care. If 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 should I this well, is just all simple. I can say is it confused me. Because the, the use of must and must not is easy. But the recommend is kind of stronger or weaker. Well, just just for clarification, because this this just to see if we, we have a path forward. What you're seeing, it sounds like what you're suggesting that the, there's a little bit of issue with, with understandability here with mixing normative and non normative language. Right, so I'm gonna sign. Should I do one of the musts or the recommended? Right, and it turns out that must has a specific meaning in the process we're talking about and not recommended, recommended does not. Wish it it does. What I'm hearing, let me finish, what I'd like to suggest, what, what's the normative term that's, that's the equivalent of not recommended? It seems like an easy change to make. Should, yeah. It, it should okay. not. The document. Jeff, we'll make you happy, it will be okay to say should not instead of not recommended. That'll make you happy. The document. Okay. Oh, well. The document that defines normative language specified that should is equivalent to recommended. I just want to get past the terminology issue because it doesn't feel all substantive of, to me. All of Coleman uh, uh, Internet Society, but it doesn't matter now. RFC 20, uh, 2119 says, should this word or the adjective recommended mean there may exist valid reasons, blah, blah, blah. The... <laughs> The, the, the RFC puts them on equal setting and, and recommended is a 2119 equivalent to shoot. So. Thank you. We can make sure that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul. No, I, but I specifically used the, those words because I read the, the, yeah. the RFC. Oh, I've just right. quoted. I know that it's not commonly used, so I'm happy to. Like change it back to should not and should, but well, neither of you speak the proper English anyway. So I mean, you speak the Queen's English, so so. <laughs> yes, it's nice. Okay. Okay. Paul, and then Martin, I was going as at the end. Uh, I propose to change. Paul was for. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, let's let's get Paul in there. Okay, so I, I just want to make a quick note in response to Mark Andrews about the uh, the, the T6 and 6 zero algorithms. Um, those are actually lagging much more behind other ones. So, for instance, if you were running a Red Hat server, then only recently could you use something that is uh, not as weak as uh, HMAC MD5. So I think we should be much more conservative uh, with those, and I'm not sure if we should pull them into this document. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Just wanted to say I would propose to change the must into required. <laughs> is that normative language? Yes, it is. It's, e it's equal in 2119. <laughs> it helps to be a fan of iron. Hi, I'm Jim Fenton. I just want to clarify that this is, has to do with the implementation, what goes into implementations, not what you actually sign with, because I'm concerned, especially looking at the ED25519 line, it's sort of saying recommended, um, but it's only recommended on the validation side, which seems like it could produce an interoperability problem if people actually took that seriously. Um, well, the recommended, um, if, you, if you read the draft, we use the recommended as a um, way of saying this will become must in the future, so uh, please implement it now so it doesn't create interoperability problems in the future. Right, so, so I'm saying maybe, and, and I apologize that I haven't read the draft, I'm responding to the chart here, that this has to do with implementation, not actual use in the field. Yes, yes. Thanks. Well, actually, I have one. I have a question. If nobody else does, um, if I was, if I heard you correctly, there was, you know, implementation 
discussion on some of this, but I don't immediately see it in the draft. Would it be a big challenge to add a brief implementation status section? It Just be because that's that's something that we've discussed frequently in the working group recently, and people have have you know, people seem to tell that. Makes sense. And, and just maybe more comment. Um, this is for implementations of the fancy color tables, um, but this is like the deployment uh, device. Yep. Yeah. And I do see people at the mic. Too oh, short down here. Um, so Warren Kamari, just on the previous point. I know that the document does talk about, you know, this should be implemented and it's not what should be used. But lots of people will just flip through documents and see, like, the big table and assume that that's what they should use. So you might want, like, H1 blink, you know, red text above and below the table being, like, just a reminder, this is implementation, not what we're recommending you deploy right now. That's why there's a paragraph about what should be deployed. Like, this is the it, it's, standard. It's not, that's, I think, further up in the document. I think having it nearer the table as a, you know, okay. you should have actually read the rest of the document, Chuck, not just flipped to the table, but seeing as you've already just flipped to the table, just an extra reminder. Okay. Uh, Tail, I'd like to actually um, ask that you not make it blink, as Warren just asked. That I think <laughs> is a terrible idea. But actually, what I got up here for was I'm curious, do we just need a really quick hum on agreeing that the um, must and recommended language is just fine without switching, or the must and yeah, and recommended without it switching to required, or just I think we're really actually mostly in agreement that we're all okay on that. But since we heard some, you know, suggestions that different terms should be used, let's just a, a quick hum. I think might be a good idea. Um, <laughs> I'm I was also planning to suggest taking to the list so people can think about it a little bit more but sure we can we can um... and, and we can surely use more reviews from the working group as usual but sure we can no but i appreciate the suggestion um for those who feel that um the current language in the draft is understandable for their purposes so we are not asking the editors to change it please hum now And those who feel strongly that it should be changed, that there's a problem with understandability, please hum now. Okay, that's informative. <laughs> no, it's informative. <laughs> okay, so what that sounds like is um, with a little bit more of implementation status and advice, that, that that's what the working group is asking you to do. And I, I, that should be a relatively straightforward revision, and then we'll do working group last call. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Let's move it. That's right, you missed one. So you can start by checking the page again, or that page is for by checking the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have parked the bike in the bike shed. Okay, so DNS cookies are a countermeasure against all sorts of uh, off-path attacks. Uh, the most notably, perhaps the, the one in which the attacker uses a botnet to send uh, uh, queries with a uh, spoofed source address, and the, the address is of the victim, and it sends uh, queries to a uh, name server asking for a large answer. And, as such, overflowing the victim with, uh, with a lot of traffic. And uh, so the time that uh, cookies were uh, emerged, the, the uh, idea was, well, uh, the problem is that there is no handshake between the, uh, the one that sends the query and the one that gives the answer. And one solution is to use a stateful transport, but that doesn't scale very well with DNS because uh, uh, DNS can currently scale to many, many queries a second because there's no state at the authoritative uh, server. And, uh, TCP uh, keeps state for every uh, client. And so the, the cookie is a uh, way to uh, address this with uh, just having a single secret on the uh, uh, server. 
process of the events. It's so, so a sort of handshake. If you have made the handshake, you are known to the authoritative server or the resolver for that matter. It doesn't really matter. It works for both step to resolver and resolver to authoritative. If you have made the, up the handshake, then you are a known client. You get the uh, large answers uh, or the, the better responsiveness. If you did not make the handshake, then uh, you will be uh, get, a, get a short answer or will be subject to uh, response rate limiting or some other policy. So um, the, the operators of DNS that had to deal with amplification attacks immediately, they, they had to deal with it immediately and uh, implemented uh, things like priority lists for the known resolvers, they kept statistics on these are the golden 50 resolvers that we always see, and they will always get answers and dealt with it uh, that way, and also with response rate limiting. But the uh, vendors of DNS software saw it as a protocol flaw and thought we can deal with this in the protocol uh, itself. And uh, so that's the reason that uh, we push for this uh, DNS uh, cookie uh, uh, draft or RC. And uh, but there's an issue with, uh, uh, it's important that all vendors do the same thing, of course, and especially in uh, any cost uh, deployments that the same cookie or the same algorithm is uh, deployed amongst all servers that participate in communication for a certain IP address. And so, uh, operational practice. Uh, and with that, um, you heard me back again. Um, so, um, the operational impact, the, the good operational, operational impact is that uh, uh, the servers can have improved policies based on cookies. So, if you have a cookie, you can, as, as William said, you, you can disable RL, you can um, do all fancy stuff to, to like, deciding what's what's a legitimate client or what uh, who's not. Uh, uh, you can have a better responsiveness under attack because you can like roll away like it's without uh, without cookies and redirect them to TCP to get a cookie. Uh, but the bad side is that um, in any kind of situations, especially when you deploy like multiple vendors at the same IP address, which happens quite often in, in current world in any cast, um, especially the, at the at the root and, and TLD level. Um, uh, and, and then you have a problem with state synchronization. Um, so uh, the, the anycasts are the, the like most uh, most problematic ones um, because there, there are multiple implementations deployed the same anycast node, um, and and the deploy server uh, sh should share the same server cookie secret and and same cookie algorithm. Even though the clients uh, should handle multiple cookies if they are compliant, uh, uh, but uh, in the real world, you can have a mix of servers with and without DNS cookies. Uh, they might have a different deployment schedule. You just like deploy a new version of Bind that has cookies, but you have a, like NSD or no DNS or Power DNS at the at the same node, and they don't have a cookies at the, at the same time. So now you have a at the same anycast node uh, hidden behind the same IP address. You have um, a different servers with like different state of the implementation. Um, uh, with cookies, without cookies, different cookies, it, it gets too confusing for the operators. About, from my my like uh, uh, my experience, you can also have uh, like a fruit, uh, a different operators for parts of the cloud. So uh, there's parts of the cloud uh, for the fruit uh, uh, that's provided by SC. The other part is provided by Cloudflare. And they, again, these are different implementations with different like cookie, and there's some like uh, need for synchronize those cookies. Uh, otherwise, um, it it might feel like wrong. Uh, the other thing is that the unconfigured un 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 server uh, pick server server secret at random. So again, if you even if you deploy multiple instances of the same uh, same server and you don't configure it, you now have a like different. Uh, Server, server cookies hidden behind the same IP address, even though you, you have the same server. Um, the other thing is that the, there's different default algorithm. 
and there are incompatible algorithms in what the input data goes in into the like the function. Uh, it doesn't have to be a shift function. Uh, and uh, there are also deployments, and this is with the per permission of Ripe and CC. Uh, the K root does like fancy thing to the routing. So um, almost every time you ask, you get a different implementation. So if, if you run a loop over um, over the K root IP address, um, so it's not a, not only a routing problem like with the BGP will switch, but it's a, like a local problem for the, for the nodes. Yeah, and you are still connected to the same anycast node, but they rotate the, the implementations that answer the, the answer the query. So on every on like on every query, you get a different cookie based on the um, on the server you just you just hit. So uh, the solution we we will work on as, because this is vendor initiative, uh, we will probably do this as, as a vendors. Um, that uh, we will define. A, we will write a new um, uh, draft that will define the like the mandatory uh, algorithm to implement between the implementations. Similar thing to what we did to do the DNSSEC you know, algorithms. Uh, so, so both the crypto functions and the how the input data uh, into into the function is feeded uh, will be standardized as a like this is mandatory. Uh, we want to add a SIP hash. This is pseudonym function. Um, this is exactly designed to things like network traffic authentication. And it seems like a best fit because it's fast and it's designed to, for this kind of thing. Um, and, and we'll define optional algorithms to implement because they, they are already there, like HMAC, SHA-256, and um, AEC. Um, uh, the other thing is that we probably should remove the non cryptography secure algorithm. There's, there, there's been FNV uh, algorithm defined in the original graph. And that needs to be removed because it's not really suitable for this kind uh, of use. Um, and the document should provide the guidance both for, to the DNS vendors and the DNS operators how to deploy in such scenarios. So, any questions? Before my own company eats me. <laughs> oh, uh, Francis Dupont. So, I think Paul was first. Uh, just, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm in front of you. <laughs> uh, can you go back one slide? Sure. So mandatory algorithms, but you still have a lot of options. Can you explain that? Um, no. <laughs> if, you, if, you think, if, you, if you think we should have just like all of them mandatory or all of them like removed optional and just one, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting. That. I was just asking for clarification. This is like very preliminary work, so but there's a real need to define such a document. So um, we might decide to remove the HMAC or AS. Uh, I like I would like to just have a, like one algorithm, but I think we need some algorithm flexibility for for the future in case well DJB will be wrong because it's DJB's function with some other algorithm. Um, okay, Francis. So Francis Dupont, uh, I'd say. For her, the choice of the right algorithm is not for her, it's for a cryptographer. On the only age of uh, DNS cookie, Mark Andrews asked me what to use. And I just forwarded the question to, uh, for, uh, to a cryptographer. So say, yeah, Ash HMAC is a view solution. And the answer, ES is better, it's, fa it's faster, it's at least twice faster. So it's a question for a cryptographer. So you give it to a cryptographer and say, what to use? No, we, we Safe, can, simple. We can fast. definitely use CPR, uh, CPRG uh, as a consultancy for for world which we, we should choose. Um, but I, I know that there are many cryptographers here in the DNS op, and this is will be working group document. So I guess they will chime in. Yeah. Hi, this is Donald Eastlake from Huawei. Uh, so I'm the author of the Cookie RFC. One of the authors. And I tell you, we're working on revving it to uh, include uh, a mandatory server cookie. It only really applies to server cookies that you have this problem that you need to standardize or one for uh, interoperability between multi-vendor anycast server pools. So um, I think that there may be other uh, improvements advisable in the cookie draft. I think the right thing to do is to rev that draft and uh, would welcome uh, other co-authors in doing that. Well, I, I count on you because we, we already talked about uh, cartering the draft, so um, I sort of count of 
you that you will join this effort. Right in draft. Right? Oh. You asked me to join your draft. Well, uh, no, but we, we talked before that you, you you would like to help with the draft, yeah. right? Yeah. So so you are on my list of people to okay. yeah. to write when I'm starting writing the draft. Okay, but uh, maybe it can be merged or whatever. Uh, John Reed, uh, can I um, can you go back uh, just one slide? Okay, so um, you mentioned a couple times about the the AnyCast problem, um, and I've heard you say um, multiple vendors at the same AnyCast node. I just want to clarify terminology. Is, are you talking about actual different DNS software at the same AnyCast node? Or? Okay. What about the situation of same vendor at multiple AnyCast nodes where the route may change you know, between queries? That's not a problem because the cookie is uh, is server specific. So if you like the the name server has the cookie, so to the client uh, is a client server, not client domain, so duration. So, um, the, so it, it, if if you have multiple name servers with multi different IP addresses, that's not a problem because they, they each of them each of them could have a different cookie. Well, I guess I'm asking what if the response goes to I mean, so this, the server sends the cookie, right? Yes. And, and the cookie then, in the response, the cookie, in, in the response has to be something the server knows to generate. Right? Um, yeah, it's, it's calculated from the client cookie and some other variables on the, okay. on the server side. So I guess I'm just saying, to the point about providing guidance to operators, it would be, it would be great to have some specific recommendations about how to handle that type of component. Okay. Can you pull up for us? Yeah. No. No? Jabber? Jabber. Well, no, for some reason, my Icelandic colleague over here wants to have the last word or something. So, <laughs> Dan, you are Mike. Uh, just to the point about the different algorithms, are, I think we have to go back to the audience, right, of, the, of, the, of this. And if we want to make it for you know, implementers to implement, I would say I would encourage us to not have options or to make it as clear and simple of exactly what we want people to do and to not provide too many choices because this is going to be handed to somebody who's told to go write this or add this into something and they're going to go uh -huh. look at it and say what do they have to implement and so to the point where we can give them the clearest and shortest list of things would be ideal I'm, I'm uh, the only thing I'm afraid that if we just uh, um, make only one function mandatory and there's an um, um, severe degradation of its security then we won't have a second choice. So then make two algorithms in a mandatory. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I think the, the question is, you know, if this is handed to Wes and Wes has to go implement this, Wes is trying to do 57 other things and he's going to look through this and say, what should he do? And he's going to pick the one that he has to do, which is the one that says must. Okay, because Wes does, has other things and it's going to take him more cycles to do those other pieces. So he's going to grab that. So effectively, we're creating more verbiage for a little result because somebody, now maybe maybe Warren will go implement the shoulds because he thinks it's a good thing, all right? But others will not. So I think keeping that, and if we need two algorithms, do two algorithms. Okay, makes sense. Can you go to the, I think it's the second slide? This one or the previous one? Uh, no, go back. Go back. Go back. <laughs> Why? Okay. So, or is the one before that one? Hmm? One back. Okay. Um, so basically, TNS cookies. What is it trying to solve? And if we look at this from the perspective of the, of the camel. We have, uh, for the handshake, we can avoid cookies totally if we do TCP. Right? Wrong? Okay. How does the scope of this work? No, it's not. This is a question of alternatives. This is extra work. We are going to spend a lot of time talking about it. We can do the same thing with the existing technologies. And so why do this? So you are suggesting to kill the cookies? Yes. Then. Yep. Yeah. I think this is not a good idea, and uh, if you're thinking no, about I'm, it... I'm solving the current problem that we have. That we I'm saying we have the existing solution, which is TCP, which solves most of the problems that the cookie is trying to solve. Maybe. So, maybe. But I'm saying there's no problem. problem. Did, did I, no, there are different implementations with different algorithms being implemented in... Uh, 
in the cookies and I need to solve this problem. So if you want to just kill the cookies, please write a draft to kill the cookies and let the working group decide. But I'm continuing this work because I have a real problem to solve. And one of the uh, solutions you could do in your draft is to say, please don't deploy cookies. Use TCP. I'm trying to outsource work here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you yes. can tell. Can tell. Now, quickly, you had a quick uh, just, uh, just to reply to that, actually. Um, we have a number of drafts, including things like DNS, like chain, and I think we have like the, the TCP persistent one that actually uh, talk about cookies and say like you should really do something to protect the UDP channel if you're using UDP. So even though we do say TCP is an option, there's definitely already RFCs out there that say please use DNS cookies. So you cannot just kill it. Okay. Uh, I'm Tariq Senas. Uh, having cookie uh, exposes the privacy first that it is it, it will show that the large messages will be exchanged first and the second thing is that uh, how cookies will impact the DEN protocol I mean if they are exchanging certificates and if there is some kind of cookie injection attacks occurs will that impact that protocol as well I'm probably confused about that in, in again, again, this is out of the scope the DNS cookies are already there we, we are, this is, this is the work about standardizing on one common algorithm that our implementation can do. So uh, I would advise you to go to read the DNS cookies draft, uh, the RFC, sorry. There's, there's an RFC on DNS cookies. Please go read it and it, it has answers. So, but, but no, it doesn't, doesn't do anything to the privacy. And, uh, and if you are on path and you can inject the cookies, you are, um, you can read it like the answers and, and responses anyway. So there's no, um, but, but again, this is not about the DNS cookies. This is about the standardizing single or two algorithms for that, that all implementations of it will support. Um, Thank you. Um, for those who say we should be using TCP, um, sure, we can use TFO with cookies. Oh, still use cookies. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Ted Lemon, so uh, this is kind of a little bit on the same topic. Um, there was a presentation in uh, Interior yesterday about um, uh, PMTU issues, and basically the recommendation was uh, don't use fragmentation, which I know seems slightly off topic, but of course the reason why we uh, have that issue, the reason why it's an issue is because DNS, particularly DNSSEC, tends to send large packets around, large UDP packets around, and so those can be fragmented, and that creates pretty serious problems. So um, this is essentially another reason to consider the solution of just, just saying don't use cookies rather than trying to make cookies better. Okay. But the cookies are already small. And I understand that, I understand that, like, the point, your point. Yeah, I mean, it's... But... <laughs> I have, I have the problem with like not doing anything. So if we want to kill the cookies, let's kill the cookies. But I won't like stand and do nothing. So either either let us kill the cookies or improve them so they are usable. So not improving them and keeping the status quo is, is not an option. I think. Yeah. I, I think I think that the the point that you're getting from from the people that came up to the mic, including me, to talk about this is just that we really ought to actually open that question before proceeding with this further because, um, and, and not make a big delay about it, but just like have that conversation because I think that, you know, we're, we had a conversation in the in the, uh, the last IETF about how much extra crap there is in, in DNS and how maybe that's a bad thing. And here we are, you know, talking about how to make, you know, I mean, this is essentially a problem that's created by the addition of this new feature. Right, that's, I see. Uh, I know because I've heard from them, spoken to the operators, there are operators who want to deploy cookies and can't currently do so because there's not a consistent implementation of the algorithm on the server side. We've got to do this. Well, even though it might be like wasted work, even if we proceed with, with improving the algorithm so we have a common implementation and then kill the cookies, I think it, would, it wouldn't be wasted effort because it would improve the solution for like the people here. Oh, I, I fear that moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, news. Oh. 
do you want to kill UDP for doing this? That is what you are asking for, literally. You are saying, get rid of you DNS of UDP. That is what you're saying. Get rid of it completely. Cookies, cookies work with unfragmented packets. Fragmentation is a separate issue to cookies. They're a thorough issue. And you're com confusing the two. So to be clear, I'm just reporting on something that happened in Interior and the implications of that. I'm not personally arguing that we should okay. drop <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> cookies, cookies do model things. They protect against amplification attacks. They also protect against spoofed responses. I really don't like having to open a new socket basically for every single query over UDP. Cookies have two sides. They've got a client side, a client cookie as well. That's designed to give enough entropy to the question that you can guarantee that you're not getting a spoofed response back. We can go back to a single socket for UDP with cookies. I think all the DNS implementations would like to be able to do that because managing thousands of sockets to get queries back is a pain in the... Yes. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> So, Warren. <laughs> so, and cookies work for unfragmented packets as well. They provide protection on unfragmented packets. Okay. So, Warren, Warren, again, with, with that hat. Um, so, regardless of whether or not we deprecate cookies, and I've got my own views on that, it seems leaving things like this is dangerous. Yep. And it's going to be a while before cookies can be actually removed everywhere, you know, if that were the idea. So, it seems like fixing it instead of leaving it as a rake in the grass to trip over. Because we are very good at removing stuff from DNS. Uh, Paul and then Jan. Okay, Jan Chart, that's one. Uh, so, I just want to react on the UDP stuff because I think this is no longer relevant in our world. For instance, uh, HTTP world is able to handle like thousands of, of, of TCP connections with, with very high performance. Uh, someone said TCP fast open. That's uh, an, it's another mechanism how to like decrease the latency and it has cookies protection like built in in the, in the protocol. Uh, as a DNS server implementer. Uh, we don't have uh, cookies uh, as NS1, and we don't plan to implement it because uh, the amplification factor uh, in our case, because we use online signing, is much much like lower. And um, another thing that I want to point out is that cookies are really difficult to parse and process. It's quite expensive. And once you get to this point, you have the cookie parsed and validated. It's maybe easier just to respond. So Paul, over. Then Dave, and we'll cut the mic line on that one. I just, okay. just want to, like, again, the response what you said is what Warren said. It's a mess right now, and it's we fix even yeah. if we kill the cookie in the future. Okay. Well, I'll allow to um, I just want to say that I would like all the open resources that are accidentally added to the internet at all the times uh, that we currently have to have enabled DNS cookies by default so that they're not part of an amplification attack. And even if that is the only goal of the cookies, that is a useful thing to have. So please do not kill cookies. Yeah. Um, basically, I think if we're going to spend any time and effort on things like this, we should make DNS or TCP better. We should have longer lived sessions because we have bursts from clients. And we should just bite the bullet. UDP is not good enough except for certain situations. And in regards to Mark, what Mark said, get over it. You have to deal with lots of sockets. You have lots of addresses to listen to in many cases. Uh, yeah, so, so, so it's not my, With my ISC hat on, I would say that's, that's definitely what we plan, improve the networking. Yes. But this is like, again, this is matched right now. We have cookies My right recommendation now. to the working group as an individual is let's write kill cookies draft. And, and Schwartz. Uh, so, so we've heard definitely a, a lot of interest in cookies from certain, uh, I guess, recursive and authoritative 
vendors. I'm really interested to hear if there's anybody who writes stub resolvers or is responsible for large scale stub resolver deployments effectively that, uh, that has implemented cookies or that, who plans to implement cookies. And I'd also be interested to know if uh, between recursive and authoritative, if anybody has operational experience that could, that, that would uh, inform how useful these, the cookies have actually been. Not necessarily in the meeting, maybe on the list. Willem Torop and Ahmed Lapt. Step level cookies are in the GetDNS library. So also in uh, the Stubby demon. Uh, Tail, I just wanted to um, back up on Warren's point that this is already an existing uh, mess that really needs to be addressed on its own. Um, I really strongly disagree with Oliver that the solution is just TCP everywhere. Uh, you are going to get tremendous pushback from operators on that point. Uh, while Cloudflare seems to be quite happy to go that route, uh, that is certainly not universally the case among providers. And um, no, I think no amount of improvement in the, say, libvine networking code is going to really uh, change that situation very much. And beyond that, the, one of the things that, you know, in this room where we're mostly DNS people, that I think a significant part of the community is overlooking is the existing tension that we have with one of the primary uses of the domain namespace, which is the HTTP community, and just how they feel about the, you know, any possibility of adding more resolution time into DNS queries, right? Like this is um, standing alone here and saying, oh, well, everything will just be better if we could just, you know, go to a secure stream protocol is not necessarily going to fly, at least with DNS TCP as currently defined. Yeah. Didn't work. I would just we, say. We, we did close the line, but you got a few seconds because you're the scribe and we love you. Oh, well, thank you. I would just say. But to all of her, I, I understand what you want us to do and the thing like that, but I would say, how successful have we been at massively upgrading the global DNS infrastructure with any kind of change we wanted to do in any kind of time frame? Right? So, <laughs> so, I mean, yes, we can all have an aspiration to go to TLS everywhere or something, but it will take decades or something at the way we are currently able to change the overall global DNS infrastructure. So it, it does sound like there's a, a new draft in our future. It would be, and I think the, the larger question, the working group does have to engage on, on whether, on, on the effort of, and we're not talking about whether people will do this or not. We don't control that in this room, as Dan pointed out, but whether the effort to document as an RFC and, and standardize is, is that a good thing for the ecosystem. So we'll have to. We'll go ahead and consider that when we have a draft. If somebody dearly wants to write the kill the cookies draft, I think the working group should consider Andre, that also. Andre, before you go, I have a clarifying question. Actually, it's for Don. Don, I just looked through the drafts directory. You don't have a draft on cookies. I thought you said you did. Ah, okay. Sorry, never mind. So then you two might do. Okay. Oh, man, how do you follow up a great cookies discussion? Let's talk about the apex. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey. So this is going to be great fun. So there was a little, there was a couple of side meetings about this stuff, and um, one of the things about the SRB meeting. But um, this is something that we want to talk. I want to sort of see if we can figure out a path forward on. I'm going to talk about some stuff from the operational community because I'm an operator, and this is DNS Hop. And Andre and Willem have some sort of implementers, sort of other views in the world, and some experiments they've done. So in a lesson, let me sort of. Go on a bender here. So, um, <laughs> so why do we need this? Because SRB works, but but it only works with robots. Humans can't deal with SRB. A and quite A work, but it's not unless it's a CDN, right? Users should know better, but they're users, right? And this is not going away. I think you know that. This is what I see. We have a generation of engineers now who just assume that you can have a CDN or some sort of synthesized record at the apex of his own. Why? Because the Amazons, the Googles, the clouds, it all supports it, right? And when I tell people this is not a standard, they say, but it has to be a standard because everybody has it, you know? So it's like there's a disconnect between the user community and the protocol people. And I feel that we need to fix that somehow, you know? And, I'm, and so I manage a lot of production zones. 
I work for a little cloud company. And I want to be able to sort of do those production zones in some sort of cloud instance to be able to be multi-vendor. And right now, we can't do that, right? So how do we sort of fix that problem? I do think it's something that is out there. Every, you know, and everybody supports it, you know? It, and so, you know, I, I, I do think this is the smartest group of people I've ever seen. And it's like, we should be able to fix this. It's like, you guys are way smarter than me. And it's like, I have a zillion different ways on how to fix this problem, but none of them seem to be the right answer. But you guys are way smarter than me. Everybody I talk to here is always much smarter than me. And I always feel much more enlightened by that. It doesn't need to be C name. It doesn't need to be A. It can just be something, right? We need to figure out how to move this forward and a transition plan for all these zones out there. Now, there was an interesting talk at the, um, the Applied Networking Workshop on Monday, um, Mark Allman, not Eric Allman, um, I don't want to get him mixed up, where he was talking about the, the dying attack and second level of domains and the sort of the robustness and stuff like that. And it's not there because, you know, people, they just deploy stuff in the Amazons and, oh, Route 53 is all good. And once in a while, they have a bad day, right? We all have a bad day. And I don't want to go in front of like a whole bunch of executives and employees and say, oh, we had to stop printing money for my company because, you know, Amazon had a bad day. Because the company I work for, that's essentially what I tell people, they just print money, okay? It's a crazy little company that that's what they do. So I think we can solve this. Maybe we can't. So, Lars, you know, from that note, can we please have a clear and concise problem definition? Yes, I do think we need a synthesized record at this apex of a zone that can be C name, it can be something. It has to be something that is like a CDN can use, right? Or some elastic balancer service, for example. To redirect an entire zone? Or, or just that, or just the root of the zone. Because we want root and we want dub, dub, dub. Right? Everybody wants both. Okay. You know, how do we solve that? You know, and trust me, you know, it's like when, when someone forgets to like put the, the root of the zone in a cert, and, and there's a major issue, right? Well, yeah, I think, you know, but you want to, you know, if you want to just yell at me, it's okay too. I'm not going to yell. Um, just go back one slide, please. So, um, works on the Amazons. There's an interesting thing that uh, I think Tom McCarthy, I'm not sure you say that, wrote back on I think 25th June, that kind of slipped by. Amazon solution only works if the target of their record is hosted on Amazon. Oh, yes. Because they already know the answer. Yes. And yes. that's a very crucial difference. And, but that, their users don't know that. Yeah, that's the thing. That, but that's what we're up against. It's, yes. It's misrepresenting what they're doing because they do not have a generic pointless. So anywhere on the internet solution. Exactly. We so we need to we need to be smarter and better than that. And I know we can be. I'm not dissing Amazon. I just I just think it's a you know it's this gap thing. I think I'm not sure I agree with the definition of the problem. I mean, for me the problem is that users have a domain name and they want this domain name to be hosted somewhere in a CDN, etc. So uh, they need they want. Uh, they, re they deserve some sort of indirection between the domain name and the server name. We already have a clean solution for that. It's SRV. Now, I've been to the HTTP SRV meeting yesterday, so I know it's not easy. There are a lot of problems. But my feeling is that whatever solution we find with C name, A name, it will have also more or less the same sort of problem, uh, corner case, transition, etc. So why I suggest not to frame the problem as I want CNAME at the apex, but rather I, I want an indirection from domain name to server yeah. name, and then we have several possible solutions. And in my opinion, the best one is SRP. I, I'm willing to go anywhere with that, and I'm just saying we just need that and a, tr and a path forward, right? Because then we can, if we can pick something that we can move forward on, and it's something we can you know build tooling around, then we can get a path forward, to, and we can. You know, I can use my stick as a, you know, as a vendor, as a, you know, customer of a lot of vendors to beat on them to, to make changes, right? I'm very willing to do that. So I like doing that, you know. So yes. Relaying for Tony Finch. This also needs to support alias plus MX for subdomains, not at Apex. Yeah. 
So, and I'll put on my hat and say to Lars, I mean, so the use the problem, right, is that we all used to run our websites, well, many of people run our web websites on www.example.com. But then we got tired of saying www, so we started to just say example.com. Yep. And now we want to do that. And then we got tired of running our own websites, so we want to push them out to CDNs or to other hosting providers or other things like that. And so that, now we all of a sudden can't do an IP address. And so now, you know, all of the people who are running around want to say, I just look me up on example.com. And I mean, that's the problem, right? And so now if I want to do some kind of pseudo CNAME thingy, I have to go to whichever vendor is hosting my stuff and have, use their own proprietary CNAME thingy that they call something else, right? And is that, Tim, that's what you're saying and you need to fix yep. here. And I bet if you go and you pull the dot-com zone and you look at the NS records, you will see a, probably the largest percentage of AWS records in there, right? I, I don't know that, I, you know, somebody can go, but that's what we see. I just, I want to get to a place where I can actually support, you know, z z domains in sort of multiple places that I can actually transfer between multiple vendors, right? I, I, let me, help me get there, right? You guys are smart. Help me get there. I'll take whatever you give me. Well, and I don't want to be stuck using somebody's proprietary situation yes. for my website thing. I exactly. want to be able to have control of my zone and put in there some CNAME yep. thingy that lets me go and point to whatever CDN or hosting provider I'm using today. Yep. Help me, Lars. Help me. Exactly. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I picked up on the problem. So, yes. Uh, so I have two preferences here. Please don't overload the C name yeah. thing. So I, I agree. If you want to do something, please invent something new. And I, I'm totally kind of that. okay yeah. with that. Uh, and the second one is that I, my personal preference would go with it would be to go with the um, SRV solution. But I understand uh, that there are complications and implications yeah. for that. For that. So I, just you know, not C name. Would yeah. like SRV, but yeah, if you have that, something in that's, between, that's why I call it something, right? Just give me, you know, give us, give us, give the world something that we can all sort of standardize on, right? Yeah, you know, Wes and then Mark and then Andre's gonna. I, I think Mark. Well, I think Mark was first. Actually. Okay, sorry, Mark. Yep. As you, as we said earlier, we had a very productive discussion. Yes. Yesterday. What I really think we should do is have a combined HTTP DNS meeting at the next ITF, two hours long minimum, yep. and lock us in the room until, <laughs> until yeah, yeah. get the chains on the door, yeah. <laughs> put the padlocks on the door, and you're inside, right? And you're I'm inside. inside. <laughs> <laughs> H the HTTP guys are inside. Okay. And have the, and have the bun fight until yep. we come up with an agreement that I, I, they are going to move a little bit because they have not moved yeah. in 20 years. Yeah. I, no, I, I'm willing to sort of chain those doors. And that was an interesting discussion. And Shane Kerr wrote some great notes up that I think he posted at DNS Op. And one of the things I'm, I asked him about was, I think they should be attached to our minutes because I think there are some really good conversations that went on in there. And, and I'll ask the people that contributed if, they, if they're OK with that as well. So, but yeah. Uh, Wes Hertiker, ISI. Um, you know, I keep falling on both sides of this fence, and I'm, I'm never quite sure where I'm going to land when I actually get to a microphone. But <laughs> it's the 5011 fence, Wes. <laughs> the reality is that that we are being asked to solve a problem in DNS for another protocol's problem, right? Well, no, I'm not we're solving something for the users. Okay. No, I, no. Yes, we are. Not. We're solving the, the programmers and the engineers that all deploy stuff. They're the users, right? They're our customers. The, Aren't they? The, the other pro, every protocol is our user. So, no, wait a minute. So, two things. One, one of the reasons that I'm not falling on one side of the fence is that the problems associated with putting a C name at the apex are not exactly oh, clear to many people. It's hard. Than, I mean, there's there's weird things. But, yeah, but let me let me say that maybe that there is a better solution here, right? It may be the right thing to do. The reason that serve records don't want to work is because then you have to do more lookups, and that's bad. And we're yeah. and we already talked about the TCP delay a second ago. Here's the deal: that doesn't prevent software from offering sort of better solutions to the people asking the question. If you're asking an A or a quad A of, of, of the apex, 
then maybe you could return the serve fail, you know, excuse me, <laughs> return serve fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Return. You could return the serve record. I mean, there's other ways around it without actually changing, yeah. without ha having to change the back rules. Now, whether that rule is important or not, I'm not so sure because nobody seems to be arguing that side of the problem here. I can also just deploy, deploy everything with Terraform and just push everything that way, right? I mean, that's the other answer. But, but, but I'm not really happy with, no, with, with the DNS protocol being asked to change significantly in, in ways that have been traditional for a long time because another protocol has an issue with how to use it. Because it becomes so popular that people want something that they demand, you know, as well. So, Mr. Joel. Joel Yegley, I, I personally reject the notion that this is driven by demand from another protocol. Yeah. This is driven by the meat bags who are typing on the keyboards <laughs> on the other end and they want convenience or death. Yes. Right? Those are like HTTP it didn't cause this. Yeah. Right? The fact that someone wants to type one word caused this. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right that it was not the protocol's fault, it was the user's fault and the, the, and the operators in the deployed world that is using that protocol though. Yeah, so what they came up with is an egregiously bad hack um, that is intended for the convenience of the users. There are alternative egregiously bad hacks. Um, you know, our service actually allows you to host your Apex on TCP Anycast if uh, you absolutely want your Apex to have an A record and uh, end up in the topologically closest pop. That's not a great way to do this either. I'm not proud of that at all. Uh, but it, it is a workaround that exists specifically to address this problem. Yes. Thank you. I think he had a jabber. No. Okay. And we'll kill it after Lars. Or, no, and, no, no, we're fine for time. Okay. Oh no, I'm tired of listening to you. No, no. <laughs> go ahead. Um, Roy Adams, um, about 14 years ago, I was working in a company and they wanted to have this specific hack and I didn't know how to do this. So I came up with the following, um, and we all, we, all, we all know this hack. Um, the idea is basically on, um, instead of hosting your own zone, you locally host the parent, right? So you can have seen him at the label. Now this was a terrible hack and um, yeah, and a lot of people have done this, and I just checked. It still works. They still have it. And it's a horrible hack. We need to get away from that. And I love this discussion. I think it's very, very um, important to solve. Um, if we don't solve it, those hacks will remain and will remain forever. It also means you can deploy the NSEC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing I learned last week um, about minimal responses, it's a bind configuration statement is that you can make it so that it doesn't respond to the NS records in case of an NS domain uh, response. Right? In the absence of NS records, who needs NS records at a child anyway? They're not necessary in my humble opinion. They confuse a hell of a lot of people. So we don't need uh, NS records at the, at the apex. Um, what if we just do this um, paper exercise, if a C name is at the apex, what would break? And then we look at these individual things. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I don't. I'm not saying I swear by C name, right? I no, just, I, 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 I get that. But, you know, but um, I haven't seen your presentation, and I know that a lot of things will break. But it's good to have a list of exactly yeah. what will break. And he broke it all. It's great. <laughs> That's why I love him. He's great. He breaks yeah. everything. So. Yes, thank you. Did Did you have it? Okay, Jer Jared. Hi, Jared Motch. I, I, I may or may not work for a company that abuses C names yeah. for a living. Um, so, 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 yeah, so in looking at this, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, DNS is, first of all, a very old protocol. It's, it's one of the older ones on the internet of several that have been used. I'm, I'm reminded of what happens with, uh, you know, the many applications that I've used over the years. So you using SMTP, using Gopher, and using like a variety of these other services that, 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 that uh, inherently date me of looking up stuff on Archie and such. So in, in looking at, yes, thank yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to melt your brain. No, I'll, I'll do it. So uh, in looking at what happens, there's, there's a lot of special handling cases for how 
applications deal with certain things like C names. Like it, the mail servers, if you yeah. email a C name record, it will actually rewrite the addresses and the headers to go and match wherever that C name follows. Used to. Uh, and it may still, depending on how you're <laughs> configured. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there's a lot of like historical experience with how we handle this. But there's also, if you would email, you know, a host name and it didn't have an MX record, it, you know, the send mail, post fix, whatever, will try that direct IP address, which is what we're seeing from many of these applications today. And it, it seems to me like an an acceptable way to address some of these things is to go and assign some record types for these applications. They don't have to use them, just in the way that mail doesn't have to use them. But we have the opportunity for them to use that capability to then go and follow something, be it, you know, the A name, or, you know, the al the alias or whatever, yeah. and go and provide a method such that somebody can do stuff. To, so they can go and say, hey, I want to do multi CDN and I want to use Joel's network and Jared's network yeah. together, uh, in some way. And it seems like in we need to at least try something and and present that to folks Do and you, sorry, that for me is a, is a key key thing that we need to focus on is not so much this application is broken but we need to try something and we need to provide something for the people who use those applications yep. to follow did we want Willem and Andre to oh, they're discuss yeah. the yeah. experience they've got some stuff too so but they these people want to, very wants to yell at me um, Dan looks like he's ready to read from a laptop Channeling Tony Finch, uh, my view of A name, et cetera, is that RFC 973 fixed inconsistency bugs in C name in the wrong way by making C name very awkward. So we need a better fix. So that's just Interesting. He went deep on that one. I, thank you, Tony. <laughs> so, and I was actually sitting up here for my sake to say to Wes, this isn't a protocol, I mean, thing. I, this is a user. Like the, the use of DNS has evolved, you know, as we, and we're getting that feedback back in here as the oper, as an operation group that the use of DNS has evolved and the use of the way people use it out there because we do, yeah, people don't want to type in www, that whole, you know, in, in the space, in the web space, in the HTTP side. So the, the, the users, the user community outside of these worlds, yeah. you know, and that's really what we're looking at is then how do people how do people who publish websites respond to that change in user behavior? How do we make it so that those things work that way? And the, the reality is if we don't come up with a solution, people will continue using the seemingly thingies from yeah. the other big providers out there. And they will wind up being stuck into centralized, you know, proprietary systems because of the fact that at the end of the day, I have a business goal. I need to make sure that my website works at internetsociety.org, all right? I, I got to have it work there. It's got to be there because that's what people want to use in some yeah. way, all right? Now, mine does work and it's focused on www, but let's pretend. Okay, I want to be able to do that. I have a business goal. So if my business goal is that and some vendor says to me, I can do it for you. It's simple. You push this button, boom, yeah. all right? Now, maybe it means they have to own all of my DNS and everything else and all that stuff and I have to host with them and everything else, but I'll do it because my business goal is that example.com has to be there without www. Yeah. So if we can provide a standardized way, then we get to a system where we're not forcing people to go into closed proprietary clouds to go make that work. We can slave zones, we can do fun things like that. So Murray, I know you have something great to say. Murray Kucharati, future DNS op co-chair. Um, <laughs> I just, I hear, Joel, Joel's the first one that said something, Dan just said some of it, and it seems like we're driving a protocol change uh, down at this level for a change way up in meat space, and I'm a little bit, but those make me nervous. And there may be no other way to do it, but we really need to be careful about doing this because, you know, next month users might say, well, why can't I leave calm off, and you just know what yeah. the hell I'm talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, we'll just insert ARC records is, is, is how we actually communicate to each other. Yeah, there's, exactly. there's, a, there's a potential very far away horizon where yeah. this is solved. And I, I, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and I agree. I, but I think we're smart enough that we should be able to sort, of sort all that out. Let's, let's make sure that we go after yep. you to, the, to, to Andre. Yeah, to Willem and, and then Andre, yep. Well, about the proposed, yep. about the experiment, so we have something concrete to discuss. Uh, Lars Lehmann here. I, I am really not comfortable to, to approach this from a user convenience angle. 
I do understand the multiple lookup problems with an SRV record or something similar. So that's why I'm willing to look at a new record type that kind of combines all the lookups into one uh, for uh, whatever. But you already have a second lookup that you need to do because if you follow a scene in today, it, it ends up in a name and you have to do a second thing anyhow. Um, but uh, the complexity thing, uh, we have software to solve that. No one writes HTML code by hand anymore. There's a reason for that. It's complicated. So we have software tools that help us with that. So I see a business niche for someone here. I'll take it if you don't, uh, to stand up a you know online service, uh, if, um, configure my DNS.com, uh, where you put in what you want to have, you press click, and you then copy and paste what you need to do. Yes. <laughs> I handed it to you, so you're welcome. <laughs> No, thank, thank you all. No, it's it's all good feedback. So we're just, you know, I think we want to pat, we all want to pat forward, right? Yeah, so I shall try to give uh, a implementer's uh, perspective, not, not the implementer's perspective. And there's also a lot of repetition of things that have already have been said, but uh, I'll, I'll try to skip over that quickly. So C names at the Apex do not work because of this statement in RC 1034 that no other data should be present <laughs> than the SSAC name. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, resolvers and authoritatives and all main server uh, software took this uh, as, a, as a rule and uh, so it's, it's just not allowed by the software. Also in DNSSEC validation, bits are tested on NSEC records and things will not validate if there is a C name next to some other record. So from an implementer's perspective, uh, standardizing on C name at the apex or at, uh, together with something else will be very hard because there's no incremental deployment. Uh, all the resolvers have to be adapted first before uh, people can actually use that uh, feature. So there was a proposal uh, already eight years ago, which has very recently been updated, I believe, but uh, we'll come to that later. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, so uh, this has all been said, I think. Uh, yeah, so uh, the SRV uh, record, uh, that's also uh, my uh, with my implementers had on uh, uh, perception. It's not a DNS problem. DNS can help in uh, resolving the issues with uh, using SRV. Like for example, we could put the resolution of the SRV records in the additional section, DNS signed, so it's uh, solid to use it. Uh, DNAME, there's DNAME, but it, it does work for everything example.net, but not for example.net itself. So it's not the thing that the users want. Uh, a name expired uh, on my birthday last Sunday. <laughs> and, but I, I think it was, it moved forward and it addressed things that uh, like, uh, for example, the offline sign DNSSEC, there was a, a solution proposed for that. And so, I don't know, I, I guess it could just be uh, uh, picked up again to, to work on this, from my perspective. Uh, but there's a new draft also posted on my birthday last Sunday. And uh, Andre is uh, going to present the idea of having the C name plus D name at uh, the parent right now. So, okay. uh, so <laughs> this this hackathon, I ran this little experiment because uh, we talk about it a lot. And in a great tradition of running code, I, I wrote some code. So the goals of the experiment during the hackathon was to like put the C name plus D name in the parent zone and to see what works and what breaks. And the other experiment was C name plus D name into Apex, put them into the Apex of the zone and see what works and breaks. Uh, 
I hacked up the bind to allow the C names um, everywhere, basically. And I have running somewhere on my machine, and these are real names, so you can, well, no, please listen to me, then go play with them. Um, so the, these domains do exactly what, uh, what they say. Um, and if you want, in the remaining email, I will send you the contents of the zone so you can see what's there. Um, so uh, the C name at the apex. Um, I tested the bind, power DNS recursor, unbound, not resolver, Google public DNS, very sound public DNS is probably running one of these. Quad9 um, is running mix of power DNS and unbound. Uh, Cloudflare is running not, not resolver. So, um, and I did this in different scenarios. So this is like, uh, and the result is that um, most common case is that the C name mask everything in the apex, even the SRA record, NS records, MX records, everything. It, it sort of works, but everything is like redirected to the target domain. And I'm not sure this is like, uh, uh, what, what do you want? If, if, it's, if it's orange, um, yeah, as you can see, I learned to use the colors in the presentation. Next step is the comic sounds. <laughs> um, so uh, if it's orange, uh, then it redirects everything uh, but the SOA record. Probably gets cached somewhere or, or something like this. I, I, I don't really have an answer for that. These are just preliminary results. results. So um, so this, this looks bad, right? Um, this is probably something we don't really want to, to redirect everything. but. But maybe users want it, but again, these are just some of my findings. So for C name plus D name at the parent, it's much, much better. So if you uh, if you have a like for example, I have a domain dot 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 C name plus D name dot rocks, uh, that's C name plus D name, then almost everything works. Uh, and uh, the the reason why uh, power DNS recursion fails here might be that there's, there are upcoming fixes to dename in power DNS recursion for the two. Um, so I filled the bug with them to solve the case as well. But if you put CNAME plus DNAME into the parent zone together, then almost everything works as expected, including DNSSEC. I forgot to say these domains are DNSSEC signed and they have a wallet chain. Um, the, the other problem is with, with not resolver that uh, uh, the, the, the D name returns all the records it should and then it resumes set of fail along with that. So that's probably back. Uh, Andre, uh, before, you, yeah, before you go on, I think a you have clarifying a question. question. Uh, why NA in some of those columns? Because they uh, don't support the feature. Because there's uh, the Q minimization the server doesn't support the server it. doesn't. Thank you. Okay. Well, the recursive server doesn't support the Q minimization. Sorry, uh, Tony Finch had the uh, had a mic. Uh, he said B name is being resurrected from the dead? Question mark. C name plus D name is not a solution to the C name plus other data problem. No, it doesn't tell us that. Um, and I'm, I'm just reporting my findings. Do you, yeah. whatever you want with those. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead and finish, and then we have a few more minutes for discussion. Um, so, again, I said this is our DNS <laughs> sign, so this is the graph from the uh, DNS base. It looks cool. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, resurrected, I resurrected my old C name plus D name draft back from the days of DNSX. So uh, please don't be harsh on that. I really just a quick, did a quick update and, uh, and Vicky told me my English were horrible. It was horrible at the time. Um, so it might, if we want to progress this, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's up to the working group. I'm just like, I just found that if you, if you put the C name plus D name, similar what to, uh, uh, Roy has said, uh, it, it sort of works. So it might be a, like interim solution before we come up with something that's like well designed. Um, it doesn't really replace a name it, it, because it redirects everything. Like this is, uh, 
this is no because a name is only for a and quote a but the senior position reduces whole whole domain to to like different part of the tree but it, it provides a quick working solution that's deployable right now because everything mostly works and um, um, and it like scratches the edge that for example people with IDN domain has or um, so, so the, the problem space and the solution space is, is a little bit different than, than the ANM. But it's worth thinking about that it might be a solution. Uh, also, it will like need the TLDs to support this. But if the TLE wants to like support IDN in a very lightweight way, that might be a way forward. Like put the CDN plus DNAM, sign it, and then redirect all the IDN domains to the, like the, the base domain. So. I have a couple of questions with that, and I, I think I solved some of them with Mark, with discussion with Mark. That uh, it might be good to return the D name along with the C name for the owner query, so the resolver knows about the D name uh, before it like gets to the other part of tree. Um, that maybe the, the, the NSEC might help here, but again, this is the deployment program. We, we would have to upgrade all the resolvers, so uh, so I'm not sure if if we should make the NSEC mandatory for this, but it might be a little bit helpful because there's inf information that there's a C name and D name in an NSEC record. But again, this would need some protocol changes. Um, and uh, now you can eat me alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do have a few minutes for additional discussion and uh, to see where, where, if anywhere, we've gotten on this. Yeah, John Levine. First, I must say I am astonished at how many OKs there were in your chart there. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is worth writing up. I would not suggest progressing it because, as Tony said, um, this this is the B name issue, which is it, it's a totally the C name plus other records of the Apex tend to be for stuff where like your your mail server is here and your web server is there. C name and D name at the apex is it's an ICANN problem where it's like I have this Chinese domain and that Chinese domain with where the characters are written differently, and we've gone around and around and around with that. And the conclusion I have come to, which I think a lot of other people have come to, is that this is primarily an issue of the problem they're trying to solve is primarily a problem of provisioning the application servers. So like when you know you can put in a D name like <coughs> back when .cat had D names. You know, you had you had, you, had, you would register something dot cat with accents, and it would it would it would dename it to the something to the equivalent thing without accents dot cat. And I went and I looked through. I just sort of did some samples, like how many of the web servers in dot cat were actually provisioned to handle both names, and the answer rounded to zero. Um, so it's yeah, so it's 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 an application provisioning problem. And I said, by the time you can provision the applications to make your mail server work and your web server work and your you know your chat server work, spitting out a couple of, of, of zones. To, uh, to to make the DNS correct is like the e your easiest problem. So so I basically so having rambled. You know, my, my the summary of my suggestion is this is cool. Write it up, but do not, please do not progress it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I forgot to say that the reason why there are so many OKs here is because the C name. Um, is like mutually exclusive from the from the D name answers because like the C name targets the node and the D name has everything under the node. Oh so yeah, I, I understand sort of semantically why it works, but this is like this is a code path that nobody would have tested that just seems to probably work by mistake in a lot of these places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Or or maybe because nobody optimized to look if there's a C name upper in the tree. And it's probably the right thing to do. Yeah, it seems that this provides data about how the world actually works. And yeah. there's also a discussion that we should probably continue on the mailing list about how the world ought to work. Yeah. And what, how big is the gap between them? Uh, uh, right, one of the actions from the group last night is they were talking about setting up a separate mailing list yes. for this discussion. Um, so if you guys as chairs have feeling that that shouldn't happen elsewhere. Oh, no, I think it should. And that may be because it, it may be that this is enough that we spin up something just very, you know, very specific in the, as a working group just to sort of, you know, attack this, right? I don't know. Ben Schwartz. I'm sure most people in the room know this, but maybe some don't. So I just want to mention that uh, Quad9 is using PowerDNS and Cloudflare is using that result. Yeah. So those, are, uh, the, the, those patterns of failures make sense. It's essentially the same error. Yeah. 
um, I've been told by uh, Peter van Dijk that the Quad9 also uses Unbound, so you get un inconsistent results from Quad9. That's what I was getting when I first tried. I, I do think we want to work with the, the HDP people. I think that conversation yesterday sort of led me down that path that I think we need to figure out some path forward. Yep, yep sort of see if we can sort of bridge that gap. And yes, I, I but yeah, and the, the minutes that Shane wrote, I think we're going to add them to the minutes that he wrote. We're going to add to the minutes for DNS op. Um, and I'll probably send out a note about that. Mr. Hoffman. No, please don't. Okay. Um, it was explicitly a side meeting. Names were not kept and such like that. Okay. Yeah. So for those of you who weren't there last night and, but have read Shane's notes, I think Shane's notes has, has a significant error at the end that very much affects this, which is um, there was a question asked, who's interested in working on this forward? And a bunch of hands went up. And I was, I, like everyone was like, great. And then someone else asked, or someone asked, how many of those folks were web developers? And it turned out one person raised their hand up halfway, and that was it. So, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, actually I, I, I just got, tail, set, tail agrees with me. From where I was in the room, I saw maybe like 10 people put up their hands when asked who were the web guys in the, in the room. Without having an argument here about what happened in a meeting, most of us weren't in. Yeah. I'll this just is why I don't want the minutes to be part of it. I will suggest that people who are interested in the topic read the notes that went to, that we can discuss the notes. But I think more important than what happened in a side meeting yesterday is how much interest there is in working on this. And if it turns out we're happy to host the discussion in the DNS op list as long as that's appropriate. If we find that there's a gap, for instance, that there, there's a different set of people that need to be there, no objection here to, to, to another list either. You know, it's a question of having the conversation and making sure that people that want to do work have encouragement and support to do to do well-reviewed, well useful work. Uh, Shane Kerr. So I have many opinions about all of this, but I like, I'd like to address the question of this side meeting um, and where the documentation about what happened there should go on. Out of scope. Please regard it as settled that it's not part of the NSL. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure where the little clicky went to. Ah, here it is. Okay, so uh, can you hear me, folks? I'm in the unenviable position of following <laughs> that exciting discussion. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> since I'm here anyway, I'm going to blurt out my opinion. I uh, think we should just uh, design a new generic type-specific alias, get everyone to deploy it, problem solved in a decade in my fantasy world. But anyway, uh, so I'm uh, uh, Schumann, and this is the multi-provider DNSSEC draft. Uh, the other folks that are helping out with this draft, uh, I think, are all in this room. It's Pallavi uh, Aras, John Dickinson, uh, Jan Chelak, and David Blacka. And um, in response to some uh, interesting comments I've heard about this draft, I'd like to suggest that the subtitle of this talk is, how in the modern age do we get a, an operational document through the DNS op working? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, okay, I can see down here, right? So this draft is about deploying DNSSEC in zones that are signed independently by multiple distinct uh, DNS uh, operators. I'm not gonna go through the details of the draft again because we did it last time. But if you're interested in reviewing that material, uh, this pointers to the uh, slides and video from uh, ITF 101 in London in March. Okay, so I'll, I'm just gonna walk you through the updates that we've made uh, through the draft since the last version that we presented. There was expanded text on in the signing algorithm consideration section. And there are two new sections on authenticated denial algorithm considerations and key rollover. And there's a couple of additional edits in progress, which we haven't published yet, but we'll probably put out by the end of the week. So uh, the early versions uh, of the draft had a lot of material in the front end 
that basically presented a kind of a, a taxonomy of possible deployment models. And really, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the most interesting part of the draft are the new stuff, the multi-signer models. And um, uh, uh, let's see, David Blacka in particular uh, felt very distracted by the, <laughs> by the taxonomy section uh, and uh, argued that it uh, arguably took away from the focus of the document. So he suggested to me, and I agree that it was a good idea that we just try to uh, just pull out the entire taxonomy section and uh, instead have a kind of abbreviated in introduction that kind of motivated the use case. So talk about why the uh, traditional zone transfer models do not work in these specific scenarios and why you might want to consider uh, the new multi-signer models. And uh, the other bit of news is that we uh, deployed prototypes of both multi-signer models uh, during the IETF hackathon over the weekend and we confirmed uh, that they work, which is what we expected, although there's more testing to be done, which we're planning to do in uh, due course. And I think uh, we're here to answer uh, questions and comments and critiques of the draft, but I think I'm just going to turn it over to the chairs to conduct this part of the discussion about adoption. Yeah. So we did put it up for adoption. Um, we've, we've gotten some good comments on the list, and pro a couple against, so, and understood. But um, please, if you have comments or you want to come up and, you know, don't yell at you on somebody yell at me. It's okay. You know, I, I you know, be nicer to him. He, he, I work, he works with me. Be, be kind to him. Yeah, you so, can yell at me. I have a thick skin. Okay. So, um, but um, we think this is, it's informational. It's operational. It's good guidance. I, I, you know, we're not breaking anybody's, you know, forcing people to do stuff, but it's something that is happening now and we're trying to do, but I think other people are trying to do as well. And it's like, so, you know, please take a look at it and please read. Um, and we've gotten some good feedback in, in this week, but you know, call for adoptions up until Friday. So, you know, throw your, throw your opinions out there. So. Anyone have strong negative opinions, please stand up and yell at, no, Sarah does. Yeah. Sorry, Dickinson. Um, I think this is draft that should go forward. I think for the operational community to be in a position today where they have to make a choice between multi-vendor or DNSSEC, and they literally can't do both, is really hampering deployment of DNSSEC. Um, that, that sounds very similar to the discussion we just had about stuff at the apex, doesn't it? Yeah, it? I know, it's okay. <laughs> that, that, I'm not gonna beat that, that I have camel. one comment which came out of a discussion yesterday evening on something that um, might be useful to add to the draft, which is that we already know moving vendors is difficult when you're doing DNSSEC. Does this model add any more complexity to the problem if you've deployed with two vendors and then you need to change one or both of them? So maybe we should just have a, a discussion section either saying we don't think it adds problems or hang on, we thought about it, it does. Right, yeah, so uh, uh, I agree, that's a good point. So that was on my to-do list. Uh, I'll start with your second point first. Um, uh, yeah, migrating from one provider to the other, how would you do that in this configuration? I think actually the mechanisms proposed in this model about synchronizing keys across providers does actually help you. With that. So uh, I think that's um, uh, a section we can add to the document. I think we're already planning to do it. So I think we can address it there. Um, on your first point, yeah, I totally agree. So, I mean, if we don't have a solution to this problem, this effectively excludes a bunch of uh, people that have deployed these multi-provider configurations from deploying DNSSEC, so they have a choice. DNSSEC or no DNSSEC if I want to do this stuff. Okay. Other comments? Okay. Okay, thanks, Shuma. Yeah. That's all right. So are we, are we going to ask for adoption? Um, the call for adoption is already open on the mailing list. Oh, right, sorry. It runs through Friday, so. Uh, yep. Morning. Probably wondering why I'm probably all here. Um, <laughs> we're going to um, bring up the RR draft again. 
Um, so the big changes for this uh, um, for this version is we have changed the intended status to informal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So um, we have changed the status to informal. Uh, we've spoken with uh, a, a number of implementers who are very interested in implementing this and want to see it go forward. So we're hoping that this will um, help it run through the, the paces a little quicker. Um, and that's really all I have for this. So, yeah. Yeah. How many folks in the room have read the uh, the Bogara document? Consider the okay views on whether it should um, be further considered as informational. Um, I just wanted to mention that this was another one of the cases where a lot of the relevant stakeholders are unfortunately not participating directly here. Um, John has been doing a lot of the work, like work like at Nanog, and actually has quite a few operators that really do want to use it, um, and but they're not here. Uh, and I will um, beat John Levine to the punch and say, recognize that there still is one interesting issue here that DNSOP has not frequently had to confront, but that is when you have an RR type that is going to uh, change authoritative server behavior, we don't have a really good understanding right now of how to signal that when you want to secondary um, your zones on different servers where one might have the new feature, but then one of your secondaries doesn't. So that's still really an interesting um, uh, aspect of this whole thing I think needs to be considered in a broader scope beyond just the bulk of our uh, proposal itself. I, I took a look at Mike St. John's. I, I took a look at this and the thing that struck me was that um, it sort of intends to break DNSSEC in, in interesting ways and it's it's sort of a a weasel wording of well you could do this or you could do that or you could do another thing um or you could sign online or things like that and it would be nice to have a much more baked statement on that rather than i don't know that i think this is ready for adoption in the current form because of that particular set of problems okay so um Thank you. We are trying to work towards some more solutions with the DNSX. Thank you. Hi, Shane Kerr. I, I took two questions now. So my first question is, if this is informational, um, can it move forward to standards track later, or does that have to be experimental? Yes. Informational yeah. can. Yes. OK, cool. Um, and the second question is, does a document have to be done before it gets adopted as a working group document? That's a bit weird, I think. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So. I, 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 I agree that we can definitely add clarification in the DNS section, but I don't think that should block adoption. So. Thank you. Okay. Knowing that once it's adopted, you have to fix the DNS sec part, and it can't move past that until that gets done, essentially. Right. right. And Paul okay. is right up. I'm also a little confused about the informational status because I would expect this to be either an experiment or a proposed standard, and. Informational seems to me like I could not read this, but it's actually defining a new RR type. So I'm really confused how that can be informational. Hey, hey, uh, do you want to answer that or sh shall we? Okay, okay. But let the chair know it's better. Not to dive too far into the process weeds, but that's the, but it's, the registry policy is expert review. And in many cases, we do not have to have a standard track document in order to delegate an RR type. In this particular case, given the possible complexity of processing, we probably do. But that's, that still doesn't answer my question. Why isn't this an experimental? Yeah. That is, in fact, a different question. Yeah. And, and it could very well be, you know, oh, we got an AD up there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> get, get the spray. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Warren Kamari, if this does end up being experimental, um, there's going to be a fairly strong push that it needs to very carefully explain what the experiment yeah. is and what the excessive um, failure criteria are. 
So if anybody wants to make it experimental, please, you know, provide text on that, how we would ever determine yeah. what well, the outcome was. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. I mean, I, I was going to say more or less the same thing as Paul, which must be unprecedented. <clears throat> um, but to me, this, this smells like an experiment. And I think, I think the experiment is, you know, can, it, can, can, can people actually figure out ways to implement this with, with DNS tech that works, you know, and, you know, like, is the fact, I think creating an RR type that requires online signing is, I think, is a fairly significant change to the model. Um, you know, and then, you know, and then there's, there's sort of the whole meta question of, I mean, the way, he, the way we've done this stuff historically is we've come up, you know, like I, I have, I, I have zones that are, that create zillions of records on the fly, but I use stunt servers for it because I, because I don't, I don't see what I'm doing to be, um, ubiquitous enough to, uh, to, 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 to try to push it into a, a regular DNS server. I guess, I guess the, the other thing that would be an interesting for an experiment is, I mean, presumably the point of, of standardizing this is so that you can kind of do the, do exper do expansions in consistent ways with different, like I have, I have a primary and a secondary and I want them to expand in consistent ways. I think another interesting question for the experiment would be what sort of expansions do people actually do? And, and does, the pot does the pattern language you propose actually match what people use? Okay. Um, yes. Um, that's a very good question. I, I was um, approached by, uh, or actually my colleague was approached by a number of vendors at uh, Nanog uh, who, who did recommend to do in, informal, to switch the status informal to, to move it forward. I, I'm not opposed to going the experimental route. Um, this was just a recommendation. Uh, Ray Bellis with my uh, expert RR review hat on. Uh, this can't go to expert review. Um, so this cannot go to expert review because of the additional processing required. It's not a, it's not a plain data for RR. And uh, if it's going to early, early allocation, it has to go standards track. So yeah, it can't go to expert review and the expert gets to say no, it has it needs further consideration in the working group. Yeah. So, yeah. so Dan York relaying for Peter Van Dyke. Uh, actually I have two relays, but first Peter. He says various posts on DNS op have been asking what problem does this solve? No answers have come forth. What does this solve? Okay. <laughs> so this solves the problem with having uh, a number of records that, that would generally be solved by um, dollar generate or similar uh, macro technology uh, to be able to transfer those records from uh, one server to another server in a master slave uh, relationship. For example, in a large ISP, you may have customers that want to be able to own their records but have a copy of them in a more reliable environment and send that information but they're too large to actually um, parse through all of the possible permutations um, so being able to transfer the record is a, a big problem that we're trying to solve okay yes yeah, so hi Jared notch real quick I think the problem is if you try and generate reverse DNS for IPv6, uh, your generate will take quite a while. And let me know how when your zone transfer ends. <laughs> Don't go away. So yeah, this, 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 John, this, this is a theological problem. I mean, there are there are people who believe that that having generic reverse DNS for v6 is a good idea. I am not one of them. So I think that goes back to the question of does this solve a problem that needs that, that should be solved? You know, within 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 V four addresses or within any, you know, enumerate. If you are actually enumerating the addresses of actual of actual devices, I think it's fair to say that with modern DNS servers, you could your zone your zone will be maybe large, but it will be tractable. Well, we we do we've seen zones above a hundred megabytes of, uh, that that fail to transfer reliably because when they're expanded. So this is like one of the real world things we're trying to solve and you're right there are a lot of people that want to see generics just go away um, but today this is the ecosystem we're, we're looking at yeah it does sound that 
possibly one of the outcomes of an experiment will be to determine whether the, the need is really there and just not represented in this room as, as an earlier comment suggested. So I have a second relay. Or Mark, are you responding to this point? OK. So the second relay is from Tony Finch. Oh, wait. OK. So wait. Peter just responds back and says, that's it. We don't need to fix, improve, generate into bulk. We need to kill, generate. <laughs> right. Well. On that note, we will move on to Tony Finch, who says, I think IPv6 placeholder reverse DNS can be done adequately with a wildcard PTR, and there's no need to replace dollar sign generate for IPv4. Okay. 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 Um, <laughs> what, if, what if you want to zone, zone transfers between, two, between power DNS and bind with dollar generate? I don't think that's possible. It, that works. Oh, does it work? Okay. Because it, because the authoritative dollar generate just creates some regular DNS zone. And then it just pushes it. it just pushes it. So, um, who's next? <laughs> um, I'll take the. You got the rest. Okay. Um, most of this comes comes about in history because ISPs weren't willing to do the legwork to delegate to their customers the integrated ARPA namespace. We can do, we have the technology to do that all today automatically if we want to actually do it. We have update. We have, we can quite easily so put into, today we have we, we re, re sign DNSX zones and work out what has to be removed and replaced automatically by the authoritative service. We can use a similar mechanism to say, if you've put a PTR record in, the authoritative server will just remove it with a little bit of information at the time when it's supposed to be removed. So you've got your addition and your removal. We can authenticate PTR insertion by using TCP. Name B has had for two decades the ability to authenticate updates using TCP in the reverse tree. We put it in, I put it in there so that this sort of thing can happen. We can authenticate that down to the state where only a PTR record is allowed to be got put in via that mechanism. And only for that particular name that matches to the IP address. This is solvable without this stuff. It does require the client to go and register the PTR record. But if they want, they want a name, they should be doing that. Mark, what if it wasn't A and PTR, what about a C name? So I have a zone of 900 megabytes, that's all C names, that we could probably We can do with C names as well. Okay. The, the, the authentication mechanism we've got in there says which types you will let, you, will let be added. And we can have, add the server if we want, automatically generate a timeout record, and process that and get it out of the system. This is, this is stuff that can be done. So it's not actually hard to do. It just requires somebody to do it and say, yes, we will let ourselves take a couple of update requests. People are just too scared to do what the protocol is capable of doing. So um, a lot of times, um, and just to, the, the first thing you mentioned, that the ISPs don't want to delegate the, the problem to the, the customers. A lot of times the customers are not technically savvy enough to manage their own or they just want a copy of something that's managed at a, at a larger professional level. Um, so it, we write an RFC that recommends that CPEs and hosts, if they're not running Active Directory, because Active Directory does all this today. Microsoft did this for Active Directory. They, their hosts go and update their PTO records in the DNS if you're running Active Directory. 
Okay. We can do all this, but I have to actually update both the forward and reverse. We can do all this with SIG0 for the forward side and TCP for the reverse. We can authenticate both things. It requires a document that says, do this. <laughs> this is all old stuff. Okay. Um, just a point where I'm closing my claim. Okay. Um, Mark, <laughs> yep. It does require a document that says do this, but before that, it requires a document that says how to do this, because I have no idea what you said. <laughs> and I consider myself to be moderately technically savvy, not in the world of DNS, but I think we should do this. But somebody, I hope you're going to volunteer for this, is going to have to go to V6Ops and say, if you are an ISP with a moderate to low level of technical clue, here's exactly what you need to do. And if you're a CP, here's exactly what you need to do. And I think if you want this to happen, someone has to write that document. I would really love if somebody did. Yeah. Well, I'll, Warren just wanted to stand up and say that, that he wants to be able to sign these reverse zones in V6. And I wanted to make some. in the DNS space is really quite an amazing <laughs> claim to make, uh, <laughs> given the number of ways we try and push the DNS protocol in all directions. And even if you're using incremental updates for, um, you know, Kim's zone, he still ends up with a 900 megabyte zone of CNAMES, right? Like, um, so V6 reverse is not the only use case. The CNAME mapping case is another one that we have encountered others. Um, one other way that Generate has a problem that I don't think I heard John mention was that uh, it also has a real hard problem with carve-outs. They've encountered this problem operationally. Like if you have um, a special record that kind of breaks the pattern in the middle of the zone, you actually then, your, your Generate, can, like say you needed to add a C name for some reason. All of a sudden, your Generate pattern gen creates an invalid zone. You have to fix that up with then making two separate Generate problems. And then the idea, while I can appreciate the sentiment of saying, oh, well, and then we should just do away with dollar generate, that doesn't actually make the use cases go away. It just means that now people are creating their own head off solutions for how they're going to build these zones. So, thank you. So, just a point of, uh, Ted Lemon, just a point of information. Um, there are actually several drafts that talk about the whole update thing in, in HomeNet. Um, and there's one in DMSSD as well. So um, to be a CBHT adult, so I think there was earlier some question about like how often this case happens. And if we're looking at reverse DNS measurements, we see that around 15 to 20% of those are already doing some form of dynamic generation for PDR records. And I right. think there's a current draft and the V6 ops um, talking about how to handle reverse DNS slash PDR for V6 deployments in ISPs. Right. Um, so that that is one of our one of our use cases is is to um, implement this on the V6 side as well. It, it's not not specific to V4 or V6. I'm not sure if I heard the entire question. I, I was just going to say, John, thank you for bringing this here, we have been asking for quite a while to have operators bring real operational issues that they're having into this group. So I wouldn't want to just say thank you for bringing this there. And I would say to Mark, uh, or to, you know, again, these are the issues that people are seeing as they try to solve the business realities of implementing this stuff. And I understand where John's coming from in this. And we may not like it, and it may not be, you know, the greatest idea of what's out there, but it's trying to solve these real issues that are being out there in the deployment of things. Thank you. And, and again, we can't, we have yet to figure out how to upgrade the global DNS when we think something's a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, there are a number of vendors that are currently implementing this in one way or another. I'm, I'm trying to just wrap it around a common mechanism that we can use to transfer between the, the various vendors. Okay. Hey, thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. And I think it's an action for the chairs to go make sure that we work with, with Warren on exactly what would be involved in going experimental with this. Yeah. Because that actually sounded fairly promising to me. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
Hold on. You need a little cleaning thing, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, so this, is, um, I gave this presentation at the, the ICANN IDS uh, meeting. So this is a really shortened version of it because everybody here is a DNS expert. Um, so one problem with DNS, like when we start using this as a hierarchy of trust, is that you know parents are not as trustworthy as we as we might like. They might be coerced. They might be um, they might do things that we we as a zone don't want. Um, most people believe that the most powerful keys high up in the hierarchy, such as the root key and the TLD key, will never do these bad things. But there's people who say that, you know, as long as this system is rooted in, in the trust of those, those high level, top level domain and root keys, then um, we cannot trust this because it's all under control of governments. So, so, um, so that is one part. And the other part is that we really want to do DNSSEC transparency, and we currently cannot do that because of uh, a few limitations. So. What are the attacks that we actually um, need to prevent against? So one of them is the sort of the deep link attack, right? If the .org domain says nilarchive.itf.org, this is the public key or this is the A record, and they can just skip the delegation for someone. And the other attack is, of course, that someone can, a parent can just take over the entire tree and sort of put the child out uh, all by itself and no one will hear it scream. So the proposed solution is to add a bit to the DNS key flag that says, I expect my parent to behave, or sorry, um, I, ex I expect, um, uh, I, I will commit publicly to never deep sign. So a parent will say, so for instance, .org, if it sets this bit, it will say, I will only do delegations, I will never sign anything deeper beyond one label cut. So they will not, so if you see uh, an RR sig for something in mill archive.itf.org coming from the .org TLD, you know that this is, you know, the this is a false record and they have been coerced into, into signing this or they lost their private key or something. Um, and the good thing is because it's a DNS key bit, it actually reflects in the DS record. So once, once you do this as a, at, a, a, at the parent level and the parent submits their DS record upstream, it actually gets published to the world and the parent can just sneakily change this uh, without actually changing their DS record. So either this needs to be a really advanced targeted attack where you are an empty cache and you will get the DS record from the root down and it's all new, um, or the DS record will be completely different, including the key tag. Uh, Stuart Church, a quick clarifying question. Can you go back one slide just quickly? Um, I think there's a, a little additional nuance here where you say delegation only. I think it's implied delegation only one level down. That's correct. But you can't sign a delegation two or three levels deep. That's correct. So it's not just delegation, it's like, all the levels below me are leaf nodes. Correct. Okay. Yes, this is not the, the, the I guess bind has another definition of delegation only. That's a little confusing. I don't see why this can't be multiple levels. The thing is that you get it back a referral or you get back a node, an NX domain or an empty non-terminal. Those are the only responses you can get back. That's what that's the one, yeah, that's what that's what we that's what we did when we we're doing delegation only in ninety. That's all the things we're looking for. Mark. Thanks. Okay, so so like I said, the benefits are it's it's a public commitment by the parents. So they, it's much harder to do targeted attacks or coercion because this is like broadcast everywhere. Um, and the good thing is that we can do transparent DNS like transparency because we no longer need to worry about these deep these deep um, signatures because they will all be invalid uh, because of the bit. We only actually need to log the things that we care, that we care about if the delegation gets changed on us. So we only need to log DS records and DNS key records. And then if there's some sort of targeted attack, then you actually have all the cryptographic proof to then shame the keys publicly and see what happens. Um, so I tested this out. So if you want to try and resolve powerbind.noads.ca, it's it's setting just a random key flag. Like I just stole a bit, I squatted it, and and I just wanted to make sure that all the resolvers behave properly um, if they're not updated to this new new flag. And it seems it all works. So bind on one power DNS and all the co-op servers seem to be behaving properly. Um, so this way we have some additional protection and especially important is like the TLSA records, right? Like those are public keys and we really want to make sure that those are not being coerced and we have, we have strong, uh, strong security on that. 
Um, some, some problems, or at least some, some uh, less nice properties would be. So first of all, as Mark said, um, we've got the empty one terminal. So people like co.uk uh, or I think dns.nl, um, um, they would have to split up the zone and, and, and create subzones to sign this, um, probably. Um, the second is that it doesn't protect all the records uh, in, the, uh, in the child apex itself, but those tend to not contain public key information or fingerprint information, so it's actually not a problem. Um, if you assume that you know A records and quad A records are not worth protecting because someone can steal your route. If you're if you're at the coffee shop, you know, you don't know who's answering for one at one at one at one. Anyway, you're really relying on public key material to see that you're at the right spot. Um, and the only the, the, the other uh, annoying thing is that we, we introduce a lot of prefix uh, labels um, to to signify certain services like the TSA record and the and the DKIM records. Um, and we could maybe have an exception for the prefix one, so we don't actually have to create these uh, uh, NS and DS record delegations in between. And while I was walking in the IETF hallways in the last two days and sort of suggested this to people, um, I got actually two good ideas. Um, uh, one said, if you're setting this flag, that means that I will not skip anything under my child. Um, I, will, I will let my child speak for itself. You're really also implying that you that your parent cannot undo this commitment for you. So it actually works both downwards and upwards. So if you then see that the um, so so let's for instance say if if noads.ca um, is skipped because um, the root goes directly to noads.ca and they skip.ca and that's not um, that's not what you would expect either of this DNS flag is set. So you're basically also sending a bit to, to say something um, about the parent not skipping you. Um, so that, that adds a little bit extra um, security. And it also would mean that the root doesn't have to set this because if .ca sets this flag and say, I will, you know, I will never skip my children, um, you should go uh, only follow delegations. It also kind of means that the root should not be able to override that commitment by the CA key. Um, like I said, if we do the exemption for the underscore prefix ones, that would be good because the um, uh, regular host names cannot have an underscore in it, so it really only uh, addresses services and it doesn't affect existing host uh, names. Um, and then one other idea I had from someone um, was that we could also use sort of two bits instead of one and sort of get a sort of equivalent to path length. So we can actually um, handle the empty non terminals that way, so we can skip a zone. And with that, I will take questions. Hi, George from APNIC. So, two different points, but they might be versions of the same thing. If you had this, and if you had a complete chain from the some terminal delegation point all the way up through the zone cuts to the root, then if you're thinking about query minimization, the hunting problem of where is the zone cut has actually been solved, hasn't it? Because there is an explicit signal all the way down the chain for every element of zone cut, which means the algorithm of finding the zone cut implicit in query minimization has effectively been solved. So, so, so to a point, because you're, so you're like, if you're, if you're an empty cache and you ask for your, um, for uh, dot, 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 CA, you could still get a, a deep sign directly, right? Like you, you don't know if there is a zone cut or not, but if you're told that there's not, how do you have any reason to believe it? But if you now follow this down back, so um, so on an empty cache, this doesn't actually work. So so you're still going true on an empty state. Cache. It doesn't work. But for a cache prepped resolver, if you have the signal in the DS and the DNS keys over the zones you're looking at, you know I don't need to worry the question for sister zones because they just said they don't do it. Right. right. Yeah. That that was the first part. The second part is kind of a counter statement, which is. It's because of things that people say to me in X509 PKI. Children cannot force parents to behave. And so this is a statement of intent that says, if you see this, you can't go there. But if you're thinking about the path hunting down from the root, the parent can always say, no, 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 you don't go down into that thing. You just go over to this three dotted label. If you are not in DNSSEC, it doesn't work. Yeah, but, and, and that's why we still need DNS like transparency. So if the parent does something like that, we have an audit trail for that. If I can just relay from Peter uh, Van Dyke, all parents above me cannot skip my delegation should be observed validator behavior today, even without power bind. But they can actually um, remove the NS and DS delegations briefly and serve a, a real um, label skipping record. Yeah. 
Can I? Thank you. Roy Adams, um, a few observations. Can you go back one slide, please, if that's possible? So Coda UK is not an empty non terminal. Sorry? Coda UK is not an empty non terminal. Sorry, I did this from the top of my head. Okay. okay, I should, no, I should, no, okay. okay. Um, the other thing is um, assume for a second that a parent um, does this trick, right? Has a um, delega delegation only. And just for clarity, there's there, you, you need to clarify a little bit more. You don't have to do that now. The difference between delegation only and single label delegation only. Right? You, you can delegate two levels, two, two labels down. But right. that, that's just clarification. Um, a parent that does this, um, the transparency flag basically, um, can still be coerced not to do deep linking, but that one label down, it can actually delegate somewhere else under its own control. Yes. And then do the deep linking. Yes. So, 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 so again, that's why um, so you still need a kind of DNSSEC transparency where you will see that they change keys because they don't have the private key, right? So they have to change the private key in the DS record of that child zone that they're taking over. Sure. But and so you can log that. And then, I mean, yes, like the, 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 that will always be the case. But without this, you can actually not log anything because you don't know how deep to go. So you have to basically log all DNS data, which you cannot do. Yes. And with this, you're limiting the logging of DNS at transparency to only the DS and DNS key records and the, the deep link records. I'm, 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 I'm just, trying to, uh, just trying to limit the level of coerciveness that you're trying to protect. And the, um, the, um, the other thing is this, this, this seems a bit similar um, uh, from a naive point of view as the um, label counter in the um, RRSIC records, where you basically say, I've signed this many labels. And this is to protect against wildcard stuff. So that's just an observation. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Matt Poundset, um, I have a, a question about how this interacts with uh, real authoritative data in, a, in what is normally a delegation only zone. So, for example, Apex TXT records, um, glue that's been orphaned by by delegations going away, that sort of thing. What, what would happen in normal circumstances with those types of records. Um, so, so the TXT records and everything, that, that's just fine as long as they don't contain more than one dot. Um, so if you're not actually skipping uh, skipping a label. Um, for the uh, the orphan glue, you're right. So so any 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 zone that vanishes and you, you take on the orphan glue would then be considered an, an illegally signed record and would be rejected. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. To so be to be to be fair, you shouldn't be orphaning uh, 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 no, anyway into the into a parent zone. Yeah, that seems to be a fairly common bug in a lot of registry systems, though. That doesn't hasn't gone anywhere, right? And so I think there may be a, I, I, that should be fixed, but there may be a deployment problem here, though, because that doesn't seem to be getting fixed. Right. Yeah. Ben Schwartz. Uh, sorry, I think I may have asked this question uh, on Friday. But, uh, so I'm a, I'm a big supporter of DNSSEC transparency. I'm really excited about that. I agree with your analysis that DNSSEC transparency requires a commitment from the zone not to do deep signing. What I don't understand is why that commitment needs to be uh, in the DNS or even machine readable. Uh, it seems to me that a commitment not to do deep signing written on paper for humans is sufficient for DNSSEC transparency. But now you're only thinking of like the first level, the root key and the TLDs, but then yes. this can go multiple yeah. levels down. Like how much okay. paper do you want to add? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Wes Hertiker, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a scalability problem. Um, ben, that's really what it comes down to is that if you, if, if you don't signal it within protocol or signal it somewhere, then it's very hard for anybody to figure out, you know, what can be logged and what can't be logged. and. Or, so you know, like what, a what should, suffix list, that. right? So, so this is basically a uh, you know we allow uh, get, we we allow specific uh, transparency type logging to happen at this particular point in the tree, and um, you know going back, that's really where all this stems from. Um, I, I sat on probably three or four trans working groups where this kept coming back. You know, there was a real desire to. To decide whether the root was lying to the world or not, and and it kept coming back. And in the end of that discussion, and it happened multiple times, was well, to do that, you have to log every DNS response ever you know received, and and so it's an unbounding you know, right, no problem, right? It's an unbounding problem. This bounds the problem so that that if 
an NS record even changes or, or a blue records change that is now detectable with a transparency log, whereas before it was very hard to tell, uh, you know, without logging everything under the sun, including NSEC and everything else that, that, um, that it was needed. In terms of, did you want to respond, Ben? Yeah, so, uh, so my, the claim that I'm making here is that uh, it's sufficient for the, to, to do DNS and transparency at the root, it's sufficient for the root on paper to say we're not going to do any deep signing beyond the TLDs. And then you can you can do transparency on the root. And similarly, any TLD, or I can by policy across all the TLDs, can say the TLDs won't do any deep signing. And then you can do this for all the TLDs. So I don't uh, I I don't see this as a prerequisite for for transparency logging at either of those levels. I do think it's it's useful for for deeper levels. You just made a technical error. You said I can can tell all the TLDs. That's not true. We can tell all the GTLDs, like the ones you folks own. We can't tell the CCTLDs to do uh, anything. Sorry. And, and, and again, if, if this kind of paperwork solution would work, we would also have the public suffix. Like, look, the fact oh, that that is still a, a, a hard problem to see where, you know, where the, where the split in authority lies uh, from, from the browser point of view, it, it's not an easy way to, to maintain that list. I jump in. I just want to make a comment on that point, which is what I wanted to raise. When we were first discussing this, these ideas a few ITFs back, I remember we were sitting at a table, and your assumption is most of the TLDs are delegation only, and that doesn't appear to be true because uh, instantly we had an argument from a bunch of TLD operators saying, "Hey, we have lots of deep names in our TLDs, so you can't do this unless you impose a requirement that they have to." Uh, 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 create delegations at every label boundary in their net zones. So, so that would be a requirement for using this uh, yeah. signal. So, so, I mean, TLDs are welcome to not do this, but then hopefully market forces will work and say, well, we will trust the more secure TLDs over those TLDs. Sure, yeah. yeah, but I mean, you may be stuck in the TLD where you yeah, are, sure. right? And then you have this problem that this solution didn't solve, right? And then there's the general problem of uh, leaf well, zone or enterprise zones, which are many labels deep, right? What but, are you going to do? But there? because this bit also works upwards, in, in, uh, as, as we suggested on the last slide, um, you could actually have nohats.ca without CA committing to that bit. And then if you once get to nohats.ca, you know that the, everything above it is not supposed to skip you either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We only have a few more minutes in the session, so last call for the microphone. Yes. yes. Go ahead. So uh, I'll continue. Wes again, ISI. Um, as aggressive co-author, I should mention I'm a co-author. <laughs> um, so, so Paul and I have had some discussions about this, but really we would like feedback on especially these bullets in terms of uh, what should go into the document. I don't change the slide on me. I was about to talk to them. Talk about these ones. <laughs> um, in terms of, of how simple or how complex to make, you know, the, the signaling. Um, for you know, my example was the, the whole exception thing. Well, you know. You could create new subdelegations and deal with them. Then there's ways around it. Whether you should include a depth, my my suggestion for the does not protect child APX data would be you know we limit the types of things that, that a a zone with that bit set can do. It could include glue and you know DS records and NS records, and that's it. And whatever delegation requires, without um, so it shouldn't be able to uh, spoof child uh, records at all. Um, and then prefix labels, sort of the same thing. It's, it's, uh, it's not really how it's designed. And then we've also talked about doing whether we should have one bit that signals both upward or downward, or whether we have one bit up and one bit down and things like that. So feedback on the list, because I don't think there's enough time here today to go into it. But, but please do comment. Um, uh, Giovanni, SIDN, Delft University. Um, this is not related to the draft, but uh, for the folks here in the NS Ops, uh, tomorrow there's a presentation on MapRG. There are four presentations on DNS, so if you're interested, maybe you want to check it out. Okay. Feels like we're feeling an awful lot of work this, this morning, especially for starting in the morning. Um, I think that's. I think that's it. For I, think, today. I think that's it for now. For this draft, um, it does sound like more discussion is warranted on the list, and in particular, um, reviewers would be helpful, um, particularly folks with operational interests and needs here. Also, don't forget the CDNS working group last call 
open. If you haven't reviewed that document lately, go take a look at it and tell us if you want to publish it, and or if not, why not? And tomorrow afternoon, we're the 6.10 to 7.10 p.m. slot in the big room next door. And I think that's it. I think that's it. We'll let y'all go. Thank you all for putting up with us this morning. So we appreciate it. And tell Benno not to run away screaming. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks all. Oh yeah, Benno's going live tomorrow, so he's running the show. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, blue sheets. If you haven't signed the blue sheets, please do so. And then if you have them, please wave them towards me.